Hello, my name is Dr. Howard Robinson, and we're here with Dr. Valda Montgomery in Montgomery, Alabama, and we're going to have a conversation about uh, the life and experiences of Dr. Montgomery, her family, and her um, exposure to particularly the modern civil rights movement and, and some of the real critical issues in, in her life and, and in the trajectory of this nation. But we're going to start with a conversation about um, your formative years. I want you to talk about growing up in, on Jackson Street, the Centennial Hill neighborhood, and, and growing up in that house. Um, when you mentioned Centennial Hill, I grew up in the uh, Centennial Hill neighborhood of Montgomery, Alabama, which was uh, considered to be the prominent African-American neighborhood uh, back in the day. Uh, during the 1800s. Uh, my great-grandfather, John William Jones, was an Alabama state senator during the Reconstruction period, and he owned a large amount of that property right at the, what we call the apex of Centennial Hill, which is the corner of High and Jackson Street. So um, he had uh, several children, seven to be exact, and when he died, he had them willed, each one of them, property, much like Oprah Winfrey would say, you get a house and you get a house and you get a house, and that's exactly what happened. And my grandmother got the house that I'm living in, that I grew up in, that we're living in uh, today. Um, my grandmother was Evelyn Jones, and she married Richard Harris Sr. from uh, Hill County, uh, Alabama. And they had one son, Richard Harris Jr., which was my father, okay? Um, because of the prominency of, of Centennial Hill, uh, the prominency of African Americans in Centennial Hill, it was no surprise that they would build the parsonage, Dexter Avenue uh, Baptist Church Parsonage in that neighborhood, which just so happened to be two doors down from where I grew up. So anybody that's assigned to be that minister of that church was our neighbor. And when I was a little girl, it was Reverend Vernon Johns and his family. And then when I was six years old, the new couple moves in, and that was Martin Luther King and Coretta Scott King. So they became our neighbors for those six-year periods. So from, from that point on, life in Centennial Hill was a little bit different. It was still the segregated uh, community, but we had everything that we wanted, movie theaters, uh, uh, restaurants, we had the businesses, and of course Alabama State was at the far end, which allowed us to have all kind of cultural exposure. Uh, the two private schools were also in that area, One, or two private elementary schools, I should say, were in that area during my lifetime, which was the Catholic school, St. John's, uh, the Baptist Catholic School, and the uh, Alabama State Laboratory School, um, of which I went to kindergarten at the laboratory school, but being Catholic, I was um, educated at St. John's School, so uh, ultimately going to St. Jude High School. So um, I loved Centennial Hill. I loved growing up there. Uh, I really did. Uh, and you're right, it was the definitely the, the basic spot for everything, all events, let's just say, of the modern civil rights movement. Talk, talk, talk a little bit about, talk a little bit more about the, the, the neighborhood. You, you talked about the theaters and restaurants, but really they were in, within a couple of houses of you, in that intersection right. of between right. Jackson High. Talk a little bit about the richness of that, of that area. Yeah, it was, it was filled with businesses, and you're right, that, that uh, apex of High and Jackson Street is where everything centered, uh, including the Benmore Hotel, which was built uh, in 1951-53-ish uh, kind of time frame, um, which was one of those that's listed in the Green Book. Uh, one of the places that uh, African Americans could stay. Um, little did people know that there was also another Green Book location prior to that hotel being built, which is in the same location as, quote, the Interpretive Center for the Parsonage. There was a green house, ironically, uh, that was owned by Mrs. Eloise Sturz, and it was a boarding house where a lot of the faculty from Alabama State or visitors coming into town would also stay. Uh, then that put us at bookends, if you see what I'm saying. She was on one end of our corner, and then there's the hotel on the other end. end. But that hotel was not only a strategic meeting place but and, and a hotel in itself, but it had a cafe. 
the Majestic Cafe, which originally was across the street on the corner of High and Jackson, where Tours of Montgomery is right now. I think most people knew it as the head shop, but it was Majestic Cafe. And then when the hotel was built, it moved across the street and took residence in the basement of um, uh, Benmore Hotel. Um, we also had the barber shops. We had a lot of beauty beauty shops. Um, the the theater that we had uh, when I was growing up, it was called the Art Theater. And then I found out, however, from uh, Dr. Richard Bailey, our historian, that said, no, it was actually called the Ritz Theater before, not to be confused with the Ritz Theater that was downtown, and then became the State Theater. So it changed names, but it was the Art Theater uh, when we were growing up. And so, you know, it, that neighborhood for us as children was a lot like Mayberry or Leave it to Beaver, where you just got up and you went all over the neighborhood, and Saturday mornings you would go and spend the entire day at the movie theater, and they would have all kind of programs and things of that nature. And of course, then as time uh, went by and theaters began to um, uh, to be visible downtown, um, they turned it into a nightclub, and it was a nightclub under seven different names I know of that I can name uh, before the end, but uh, that was the place that so many entertainers came in to perform. Now this is a, right around the corner, okay, so you had all these entertainers. Then you had the same entertainers on the, quote, rooftop of the Benmore Hotel, which was the place that they would strategize and meet and to party, you know, whatever. And to name drop, we were talking Tina Turner and B.B. King, and we would see Jackie Wilson st um, station wagon parked out on the street, you know, just just everything, and again, as I said, with the um, the location of Ms. Stur's house and then bookends with the Bidmore Hotel, anybody that comes to Montgomery to find a place to stay is gonna be in one of those two places. So that we saw all of these people up and down, you know, the street at all given times to, uh, to enjoy the neighborhoods, the fruits of the neighborhood. Talk a little bit about your mother, including her educational background and her friendship network, and also um, with, with her friendships with, um, with Joanne Robinson. Mama, um, her name is Vera McGill Harris, let me make sure that I tell everybody that, was from uh, Charleston, South Carolina. And she wanted everybody to know that she was not from Montgomery, that she's from Charleston. And she was from Charleston, <laughs> South Carolina, but my dad, uh, was a Tuskegee Airman, and he was stationed in Walterboro, South Carolina at the time. And Charleston is about 45 minutes from, uh, 45 miles or so from, uh, uh, from Charleston. And he and some of his friends would go to Charleston, you know, to party and socialize and have a good time. So he was planning to go and visit one of his classmates from college. He went to Fisk University um, that lived in Charleston, and she wasn't there. And his mother said, but I can introduce you to some people and introduce them to my mama. And as my mama says, and I kept him, and the rest is history. So, because uh, she loves to tell that story, so I have to tell it her way. Unfortunately, she has passed. But nonetheless, when, uh, when they agreed to marry, she didn't have the opportunity to go to, to college in, um, in Charleston because her father had died and she was helping her mother out and uh, things of that nature. But she promised my dad that promised my grandmother that uh, he would make sure that she would attend college. And he promised, he told her, don't worry about it, Miss McGill. We have a college right down the street and she can walk to it, which is Alabama State. Well, when she came to Montgomery, they came in 1945 and started a family, which delayed her going to college because he also went back to school to Xavier to get his pharmacy degree. So she's at home in Montgomery raising three children at that time. By the time he came back, it was time for her to go. So she started going to uh, uh, her classes and then she finds out that she's expecting her fourth child. And at that time, you know, they said, nope, you cannot be pregnant in school. So she managed, it just so happens that a lot of her friends were also her teachers because she's older now. So a lot of them were teachers. Uh, or, cl or uh, club members or friends. And uh, so she finished, she went back at uh, a more appropriate time and she finished as a salutatorian in 1960 from Alabama State in early childhood. Um, 
She was with, uh, uh, I think you may know Jackie Williams, Dr. Jackie Williams or Jack Mallory. They were in all that class together. And you had a lot of the women whose husbands were military that went to school later. So she was not alone in that. But um, as you say, her social life during that time, of course, included um, a lot of the members of the medical society because my dad was a member of the capital. It was called the Capital City Medical Society at the time. I think it may have a different name now. But uh, all of the doctor, black doctors and pharmacists and dentists or whoever uh, had a club and the wives were like auxiliary workers. And I'm pointing that out because fast forward when you get to the Selma to Montgomery March, one of the things that they did was prepare sandwiches and things for the marches. But going back to that, uh, that was some of her first bonds with people with the, the women there. But she also was a member of a club called the Eminon Club, which was no name backwards. And the members of the Eminon Club, several members of the Eminon Club, were also members of what we know as the Women's Political Council, which included Joanne Robinson and some of the others. Well, she also knew Joanne Robinson uh, as a teacher when she was at Alabama state and so that night that they were running off uh, mimeographing things of that nature I remember my mama saying that she helped to mimeograph these things and so this is just a recent memory and I, and I called my sister and I said do you remember mama ever saying that and she said yeah she said I remember her saying something about the purple ink on her fingers tip so that would not surprise me because people said how, did she, how could she leave her family uh, in the wee hours of the morning to run these things off? But we had live-in help, because I was a student with us, so that was not an issue. And if you knew my dad like you knew, he might have driven her down there, because he was just that kind of supporter for the uh, civil rights just, movement. Just to be a little more clear about the, the, the leaflets that, that were run mm -hmm. off by Joanne Robinson, mm -hmm. what was the, the purpose? and in, in the story behind the leaflets? Well, we'd have to, in order to talk about those leaflets, we'd have to really talk about the uh, the bus boycott and, and how that all started. Um, and I think there's a lot of things that you have uh, more clarity to than I do, so if I'm saying something incorrectly, please. But uh, I do know that the plan was already set uh, with Joanne Robinson, especially because of the fact that she had already had an experience on our Montgomery buses. This is prior to December 1st of 1955. So there was a plan that was set, and it just so happens, as we said, even though we had other people that had uh, refused to give up their seat, um, Claudette Coffin, Mary Louise Smith, uh, ultimately Rosa Parks, um, it was now time to go ahead and implement this plan. They have it in, in session. So that plan was for them to protest the bus and don't ride. Just get the message out, we're not going to ride the bus. And that was supposed to be on December the 5th. And so they had to plan to get these leaflets out because we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have all of these other ways to communicate. So one of the things was to have these uh, leaflets so that you could put them on cars or you could get them to churches to, for that Sunday, especially for that Sunday service to get the message, you know, the message out. And um, I'm not sure how many they did. I knew it was a, an enormous amount of leaflets that was mimeographed, but it stated, do not ride the bus, find a ride from somebody else, walk, get a cab, do anything, but don't ride the bus on this particular day. And uh, so that was my knowledge of those uh, leaflets, and that one was found, and uh, I don't know, that was one of the reasons that that people tried, the, the white community tried to, to stop it, to prohibit it. Do you, um, do you remember personally ever meeting Joanne Robinson? You know, I'm sure I did. I'm sure she was at the house. Um, there were so many people in that house, my dad and my mom's friends, that I had no idea these were ultimately going to be, quote, famous people or they did famous things because this was just their circle of friends or people. Um, if they didn't meet at the house, they met at the drugstore, you know. So um, I'm sure that she was there, especially if they were having club meetings, because if it was, uh, since it was during segregated times, that's how they met, 
was from house to house, you know, so, so it my turn, so to speak, to have it. And um, so that I know that I have met her. I know that I met her, too, um, on a social level because the one of the, the uh, functions that the Eminon Club had was to, to have the debutantes ball for the girls every other year. And this was to present them to society. And um, as I was growing up from the time I was little, I danced at each one of them, waiting my turn to get to that, that 12th grade or 11th grade year for it to be my turn. My sister had the last go round. And uh, what we think happened was the civil rights movement happened and that cut it off because it would have been right at that 63, 64 time frame. So that might have uh, killed the mood or killed the spirit right then at, at that time. So, talk, yeah. talk a little bit more about your, your particular social friendship network, but also your relationship with the King family and their children. Um, well, our social network, again, was um, pretty much the, your, your friends from school, um, uh, the children of the, uh, the doctors and, the, you know, and all the people that were in the Capital City Club, and most of the professional people which were my dad's friends. Uh, if they were our age group. Uh, we were also in um, an organization called Jack and Jill, which is in technically internationally based, but definitely was nationally based, um, with Jack and Jill, so that was uh, uh, a lot of friendships there. Um, but as far as friendship with the King children, they were children under us, if you think about it. we were eight and nine years old and they were babies. So we were, quote, the babysitters or the caregivers of them when they were little. And, uh, but they were the same age as my brother. My brother, my youngest brother, rather, was right in between Yolanda and Martin III. Um, so they all played outside and we would, my, we being my sister and I, would uh, play along with them or watch them or go into the wading pool and play or they were in and out of houses and, you know, things of that nature. So. Um, but mom and dad were friends with the uh, with Reverend King and Mrs. King, and you know, you, it was a neighborhood, so you're in and out of everyone's houses as well as me with them as a child. Uh, but dad would take uh, Dr. King out on the base, on the Air Force base, because by this time uh, Maxwell has integrated. You know, the, all the rules were different, even though the city was segregated, the Air Force base was not. So they could go out there. He could go to the officers' club, take him out there to just relax and get away from all of this um, tension that was in the air. So that's what, that's what he did. So talk to me a little more about your father, you know, his background, um, the, the types of things. You, you mentioned some, you know, he was a Tuskegee Airman and he, he owned the, the, this drugstore, but get, fill in the blanks with us. It's so many blanks to fill in and I'm just finding out how to piece this together because, uh, you know, he's daddy to me. And so, um, as an adult now, I'm really delving into to who he was and the timeline that that occurred with him. Uh, to start off with, with uh, Dean Drugstore, uh, he was the owner and operator, and most people know him associated with Dean Drugstore. But what they don't know is that actually my grandfather, Richard Senior, Richard Harris Senior, was the owner. He and Victor Tulane were the owners of Dean Drugstore. Then I found out that uh, the actual Dean person was named Ulysses Dean. Uh, and Mama had told us that his name was William Dean, but William was the son. It was Ulysses Dean. So they bought it from Ulysses Dean. They held on to it when everybody pretty much died out, meaning uh, Victor Tulane, then my um, grandmother and my grandfather became sole owners. My grandmother stayed there every day to make sure that the money was right. They hired a pharmacist. And then when Dad got out of uh, the uh, air, the uh, Tuskegee Airmen, you know, in '46, uh, he started working at the drugstore to help my grandmother out, and noticed that all the money was going to pay a pharmacist. So that's when he decided to go back to pharmacy school and uh, become the sole owner, operator, etc. However, the history of that drugstore seems it seems to have been the same. It was always the place to come to on the corner of Monroe and Lawrence. And uh, Mama said people were coming from um, a lot of the rural places and they would come in horse-drawn carriages and leave their packages there because they knew 
that it would be safe, you know, uh, even with my grandfather, being that he was not a pharmacist, but he was a businessman. And um, anyway, my dad went to that. Now, as far as knowing him, as I said, he went to school, started school here in Montgomery. I know that he went to the lab school. I don't know whether that was elementary. I'm sure it must have been elementary because the next thing I know that he and my, mom, my grandparents are in Tuskegee, okay? Uh, my grandfather was the postmaster for Tuskegee Institute and he was also the second black board of trustee at Tuskegee Institute. They stayed with Mr. and Mrs. Foster who were Lionel Richie's grandparents. So they were all friends. Lionel Richie, of course, was not born then, but his mama and my dad were children together and they played together. So he went to school there at Tuskegee. There was a Tuskegee Military uh, Institute that was for uh, junior high kids. It's now defunct, but we have proof of all of this that I'm saying. So from there, he, uh, whenever he graduated, my grandfather wanted him to go to a Big Ten college. So he sent him to Williston Academy up in uh, Massachusetts. Um, I think they say either East Hampton or Northampton, Massachusetts. I don't know exactly where it is, but in Massachusetts. Um, and to, to get him ready for the Big Ten. And he finished that in 1937, but when he came home for a Christmas break, uh, there was a recruiter in Montgomery from Fisk University and told him, no, that's not where you want to go. Let me show you where you want to go. And he took him to Nashville to show him Fisk University, and that's all she wrote. Then she, he loved it, and of course, that meant that we had to go there. Of course, we did go there, so, um, but, and loved it as well. But while he was there, as I said, he graduated in 1941 as a mathematics major, and he was pursuing a master's degree in um, Chicago. Uh, I don't know what his plans were. With it. I know he wanted to either do PhD or dentistry or something. He really kind of fell into where he should have been. Uh, but that's when he was drafted and to join the, uh, the Tuskegee Airmen Group to become a pilot. And um, while he was there, all of his friends, in fact, one of the people that recently passed, I think everybody's heard of Brigadier General Charles McGee, who was in his class, that 43F class, um, uh, Colonel, uh, Colonel Charles Dryden, the one that everybody refers to as A-Train, was his best friend. And so, um, again, I have to go fast forward, really fast forward, because we heard this all the time. We didn't pay any attention to them singing that 99th song, I'm a Tuskegee Airman. He never bragged about it, but we knew that that's what it was. But it wasn't until the movie came out the Tuskegee Airmen with Lawrence Fishburne, the HBO version, not the Red Tails, the HBO version. And I saw it, and I was just casually looking at it, and then I saw my dad's picture at the end, and I was like, wait a minute, this was really a big deal. So <laughs> from that point on, I started delving into his history, and we have recently has, have found a lot of artifacts, his, his uh, yearbooks from Godman Field and all of that. He married Mama at Godman Field in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, but uh, yeah, we have a lot of history from him with the with the Tuskegee Airmen, but he never talked about anything. Nothing, none of this. I don't think he didn't see it as anything major. I don't think any of them did think that they were doing something uh, that would eventually be in the history books. Talk talk a little bit about your exposure to racism and your encounters with racism. How did you how did you become conscious of that phenomenon, and and how did you it did you personally experience it? I, you know, I think because we lived in uh, our own segregated community, we were insulated, we knew it existed. Uh, we knew you could not drink from this water fountain, you couldn't go to the bathroom, you couldn't do any of these kind of things. But it never bothered us because we have our own water fountain. And as far as having a hamburger, my dad had a lunch counter in the drugstore. We didn't need to go to any place to, have a, to eat at a lunch counter or the movie theaters or any of these kind of things. And one of the things that was different in Montgomery is that, um, like I said, if you wanted to go to the movies, you had to sit upstairs. We didn't have that in Montgomery. You didn't even, you couldn't even go into the movie theater. We had our own movie theater. There was no shared anything. 
So from that standpoint, we really knew that it existed. We knew we couldn't go to the park. And this is right, basically right in your face because uh, Oak Park is right at Alabama State. And a lot of our friends lived on Hall Street and they could open their front door and look right across the street and see people playing in Oak Park, the swimming pool, the peacocks and all of these. We could look at it through the fence, but you couldn't go in. And uh, then ultimately, you know, when they integrated it, they rather than open it up for us to enjoy, they cemented it in the pool and took the animals out, which ultimately wound up at the zoo. And, uh, you know, these kinds of things. So as far as it really hitting me, so to speak, I would, I would say uh, school. When I'm really starting to get older teenager, and first of all, going through all of the civil rights movement, and that really got me. So I, I, I know that, I know all of that. And then as a high school student, I'm joining the Freedom Army recruit. Okay, so I'm knowing how to do things and how to integrate. But little things like not being able to go to uh, Catholic high school, which was really right on Lawrence Street, um, which is still standing there, brick building right by St. Peter's, uh, which was walking distance for us. And it, I never could understand how I'm at Catholic school on, uh, in elementary, and you're teaching us love and everybody's the same, this, that, and the other. And then right across the street from us is St. Margaret's Hospital that we can't go to. I mean right across the street that we can't go to, Dominican nuns. And then two blocks, two or three blocks down uh, is the Catholic high school at that time, and we can't go to that either. And it's not so much that you wanted to go, but you're telling me I can't go. That was the part that would get me uh, get me the most. But uh, a lot of people would ask me, um, well, when did you have uh, white friends? Did you have any white friends? I said, no. I said, well, did you have any interaction with white people? No, nope. other than, you know, you walk in a store or whatever. I said, but, uh, and the nuns were white. Uh, but as far as having any kind of other interaction, like social, no, it wasn't until my 20s uh, when I had the first, and that was my first teaching assignment not in South Carolina, but in Maryland, when the elementary school that I was assigned to teach was so diverse. You had so many different backgrounds, the Italians and all of the above. And it was just, it was absolutely wonderful. But um, no, no interactions at all. So it's hard to, to answer that question. Mm -hmm. Talk to me a little bit about your experiences or observations about the bus boycott. You know, you were young. Right. Uh, well, you know, we hung around with adults. Well, I wouldn't say hang around with adults, but the adults were always in our home or down at the drugstore, and we did hang out at the drugstore. So you could hear the chatter. You know, you could hear the chatter with uh, uh, Fred Gray and, and, and all of those, and Martin Luther King and all of those people, my dad and all of them, t literally talking out on the sidewalk of things like that. And um, we didn't have to ride the bus because we had cars, number one. Number two, downtown was only three, four blocks away, so we just still didn't need to ride the bus there. The only time that we actually chose to ride the bus was if we wanted to go with our friends and ride, we could go downtown, or if we rode across town to St. Jude to school a couple of days with the bus. But knowing that others could not, uh, we did know that you had to pay in the front, get off, and get onto the back. We did know all about that part of it. But that day of the boycott, I vividly remember uh, December the 5th of 1955, um, everybody standing on the porch, everybody standing on the porch to watch to see if that Washington Park bus, because that was the two buses, Washington Park coming away from Alabama State, South Jackson going towards Alabama State, but to watch to see if these buses are empty. And they were empty. And I mean, they stood there, people were cheering on the porch. They're empty, they're empty, they're empty. So, you know, you're as a child and you're going, yeah, yeah, they're, em they're empty, they're empty. So you are following on what they are saying and knowing that this is something to be excited about. Uh, because a as I had mentioned before with a lot of people, uh, December the 1st of 1955, was special to me because it was my birthday. 
I was eight years old and I thought all of this was about me. You're planning a birthday for me, all this excitement of chatter that's in the air was all about me, only to find out, of course, it's about Rosa Parks and really the start of the Montgomery Bus Boycott. But that day I do remember, and uh, days that followed uh, was when we had to endure all of the, uh, the hatred and the bombings in the neighborhood uh, and all of that, the, the trauma that went on with that boycott. Um, those things never leave you. Let you heard the bomb. Way. Oh, the bomb was right. That at, first one. That talk first, about that. Yeah, that first bomb that was uh, uh, January the 30th, 1956. I know I remember, remember that because he was told on January 27th with a phone call that you've got three days and we're going to kill your family and bomb. And he held on to that. Um, Mom was in school and she was actually uh, at the house next door because some of her friends were school teachers. They had a big set of encyclopedias that she was using for an assignment, and we were at home. And all of a sudden, this boom, this large boom and explosion went off, something that we had never heard before. And as children, of course, we're running to the front. My dad was at work. Reverend King was at, uh, I think, at First Baptist Church at the time with the, the mass meeting or discussion or whatever. And uh, Mama came running next door to see if we were all right, and she said, stay back, just stay back. And she went back out on the porch, and of course, being children and being nosy, we we're going to peek out to see what's going on. So we saw the large crowd gather. And it's hard to tell that story today because when you're telling that story, they're looking around. They don't see houses, they don't see anything. They wonder, where did the people come from? But it was a neighborhood. People were across the street, people were behind us, people everywhere. And they had all of their. Um, these sticks and weapons and things that they wanted to make sure that the family, they wanted revenge, actually. And so by this time, however, Reverend King had come uh, to the house to make sure that Mrs. King and the baby, because Yolanda was two months old at that time in a bassinet, that she was okay, and they were. But it was, um, it's just something you never, ever thought you'd ever hear, was that, ex that particular explosion. And then, as I said, um, from that point on, you could really lay in your bed and you hear bombs going off. The community is still very small, so if something is going off at First Baptist Church or right at Alabama State, you're hearing the bombs going off in the city. Um, fast forward to, to January of 1957, since we're on the topic of the bombs, um, that was the, the, the boycott is over. People are not happy. Okay, you had two events in January, and I might have my dates wrong, because one was a night when you had all the churches bombed at the same time. And then there was the night that the sticks of dynamite were on uh, Martin Luther King's porch. They said it was 12 sticks of dynamite that did not go off. And at the time, my sister and I was staying next door at my grandmother's house. She has a big two-story kind of Victorian home. and. Uh, we were staying with her because my mom and dad were on their way to Charleston to see about my other grandmother. And um, the next thing we know, the bomb across the street did go off, and that was at People's Cab Stand, which, one of, which was one of the uh, companies that would transport the, uh, the marchers, you know, to and fro. But it broke 14 windows in her home, and the sound of breaking glass just coming down around you everywhere, shattering all around you. It took me a very long time to get over that sound. And when people ask about the PTSD, nobody ever asks what the children feel. That's why I like to tell this story, that we were children. We were eight years old, nine years old, experiencing all of this. And this is the beginnings of our life, this developmental parts of our life. So, yeah, but that's, uh, Again, that was the neighborhood, and that was uh, the kinds of things that we had to experience during that period. So, so there's, a, there's a succession of sort of events. I'd, I'd like you to talk a little bit about that. So, so talk to me a little bit about the Freedom Rides, because that, oh. that sort of intersected with your house in, 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 in profound ways. Right, right, right. Okay, just as I said, here I'm eight years old and nine years old, and then you fast forward to 1961, and I'm Thirteen. Now, in between that time, there's a lot of, of uh, protesting 
uh, and upheaval from Alabama State and people marching down the same street, Jackson Street, the same corner. So you're still witnessing the protests. So I'm, I'm absorbing all of this and I'm growing up with all of this. So now I'm 13 and it was May 20th of 1961 when the Freedom Riders pulled into the Greyhound bus station. And by the way, I'm the Friends of the Freedom Rides, <laughs> president of Friends of Freedom Rides Museum, ironically. Uh, but they pulled into that, uh, to, the, to the bus station, and as John Lewis said, they all felt that this was so eerie. We were, they didn't know what to expect because they were promised uh, security, and they did not get it. And as soon as those doors opened, a mob came out of nowhere, just children as well, included women, children, everybody, and start beating on them and primarily beating on the photographers because you didn't want to see, they didn't want any footage or fo uh, pictures of any of this going on. So you just beat them unmercifully. He was hit in the head with a Coca-Cola crate, the metal tip of the Coca-Cola crate, put a big gash in his head. Um, they dispersed and they reconvened at the um, at a later time at the First Baptist Church, Reverend Abernathy's First Baptist Church, for a pre-scheduled mass meeting. And so while they were there, you had your leaders, which included uh, Martin Luther King and old Joseph Lowry and just uh, you know, Reverend Abernathy, you know, just a host of others that were there. And this mob surrounds the church. Again, they're wanting to kill the Freedom Rides. They really wanted to get to these young people. They wanted to kill them. And they started breaking the stained glass windows, they started turning over cars, setting fire to the cars, and just uh, held all of these people that were in the church, where it was about 1,500 people also in the church, held them hostage, more or less. Um, they couldn't get out. And Martin Luther King goes to the basement to call Robert Kennedy, to ask him to please federalize the troops. They do so, the National Guard comes, loads the, some of the people on the truck and loads the Freedom Riders on the truck. And then you bring them to our house, which is about three or four blocks away. And I'm saying that because it's like, okay, well, why didn't the mob come this way? So we, that's still a huge question that my sister and I are trying to figure out two questions. Is, where was that phone call? Because this is like four o'clock in the morning when you bring the Freedom Riders on trucks, National Guard trucks, to our home. And they came down the, the uh, the, um, the corridor, the hallway, into the kitchen. They were bloodied, battered, beaten, literally falling onto the floor. John Lewis was also in that group, in the bandage and all on his head. Um, and once the, the, the way that they had it working with Diane Nash and that Nashville group was that wherever you work, the phone call, more is coming. It was always more coming, don't worry. More, if you're down, we've got more coming. And so the number count continued to grow once they found out where the, quote, safe house was. Um, people often ask, how in the world did you all uh, feed all of those people? How, did you, how could you possibly have all of those people on the house? It's, well, it was just so happened that the house had just been remodeled to the way that it is right now. And my dad closed down, uh, remodeled his drugstore and closed down his lunch counter. So all of the um, uh, fixtures from the lunch counter came into the house. So we've got the stools, we've got the Coke box, we've got the counter, we've got the grill, we've got the jukebox. All of that's in the house, pretty similar to the way it looked in the drugstore. So it was very easy to do, which meant that uh, medical needs were, um, were easily met. Uh, and my uncle had a restaurant right next door to the drugstore called Pick's Restaurant. His name was William Washington and he provided all the food, and then my grandmother lived next door, so she came over to help. And it was just, that was not an issue, feeding you. And they held their strategy sessions, however, up in this large room that we called the playroom, because uh, it was four children, so this was our area. But it was a large room, and uh, this is where you see a lot of the Getty Image pictures of them on the floor, uh, especially the one with uh, John was sitting on the floor with the bandage. And all, all of that was in that room. And um, the leaders, as I said, that were there were the same ones that you had at the church, Joseph Lowry and uh, Y.T. Walker and Fred Shuttlesworth and um, C.T. Vivian and your student leaders of Diane Nash and James Bevel and 
Bernard Lafayette, all of them. You could just go down the list of people that were the young students. They were students at that time. Well, there's also a third floor that's smaller that uh, has what today's people would say a man cave <laughs> upstairs uh, that we grew up calling it the bar. Again, as I said, segregated times. So professional people had their own space to entertain. And that was the space that my dad would entertain. But John Lewis came and he said on, on a recent visit before he passed, and he brought friends by and he said, I want to go. He kept pointing right there. And uh, so I said, okay. And so he went upstairs and he said, this is what we call, meaning the Freedom Riders, we call this the strategy room. He said the leaders would leave that second floor and go up to the third floor to make the plans, bring the plans back down for discussion on that second floor. And when I, I'm explaining that to some of the tourists that come by and I tell them, I said, you have to understand, John Lewis was a student. All these people were students. They couldn't go up there because it was the bar, <laughs> you know. So uh, he wrote in his book that dad gave up his first beer, and he refers to my dad in his book as Dean Harris. It, he didn't use Richard. He thought his name was Dean, Dean Harris. But that was one of the, the again, the, one of the strategy strategic meeting places that they had. It was also a place that they could, as I said, energize, they could rest, they could recreate, as well as plan for that next move from Montgomery to Jackson, Mississippi. And that's when we found out in the documentary that Ray Arsenault did um, that John, uh, James Lawson, Reverend James Lawson states that the major um, decision was made in that room, had the decision not been made, then you know the freedom rides would have ended right at that particular point. But uh, on the 24th, they lined up and they had a prayer breakfast. Prayer breakfast in the kitchen. Uh, Reverend A. D. King and some of the others that led the breakfast, they lined up and walked out and got back on the trucks, the National Guard trucks, to go to the Trailway bus station and the Greyhound bus station to go to. Uh, Jackson, Mississippi. So from that point on, again, that was a story that we knew. Nobody in the city ever talked about the Freedom Riders or anything, and we knew this is what happened. We were right there. We were witnesses to it. And uh, I remember during that time, my dad told us, don't tell anybody, because we we're still in school. We we're at the end of school. And uh, I was in the eighth grade at St. John's, but my sister was in the ninth grade at St. Jude, and all of her friends was saying, ah, they're hidden somewhere. They don't know where they are. And, you know, I wonder where they are, and I wonder where they are. And she said, she just wanted to shout, they're at my house, they're at my house. But she couldn't say anything like that, uh, you know. But, uh, yeah, it, it was an experience. And it really, as I said, when somebody asked me, when did you realize this was a really big deal? Again, 2011, when the documentary comes out, and I look at the section in Montgomery, and I see all of this video footage that was done in the house of the meetings and all these Getty images, and I had no idea. I had well, no idea. Let's let's flash forward, and I'm going to come back to talk about some things. But let's flash forward to to 1965. Tell us about your experiences with the movement that year. Um, it, it's 1965. I have to really go back to. Um, 64, because I'm going into 12th grade. Mm -hmm. But Jan, uh, July of 1964, July 2nd, 64, when the Civil Rights Bill is passed. By this time, we were all trained to test the waters. And I'm president of the student council, ready to go into my 12th grade year. So I've got my council with me. And we all decide that we're going to test the waters. And ink is not dry good yet. And so we're testing the movie theaters. We're testing uh, the Paramount Theater. A Fairview Drive-In, uh, there was a little diner on Madison Avenue and all of these kinds of places. So that's when we were activists, real strong activists getting involved with this. So, you know, we had already gone through all of these kinds of things, especially I had on a personal level. And then when I'm in the uh, 12th grade, you're doing 12th grade and senior things. Well, March of 65 comes, and that's the preparation for the Selma to Montgomery March. And they're coming to St. Jude. They're coming at the St. Jude as a site, a campsite for them. So we did.
didn't necessarily go to Selma to march from Selma, but we were on that meeting group when they came into town. But pri a week prior to that, when we found out that uh, the group was coming to Montgomery to, you know, again, as Frank Johnson, you know, can we get this coverage? This is our third time trying to come across this bridge. We need to know that we can come and do this, you know. Uh, that was the meeting down at Alabama State. And because we were with the, uh, the recruits, it was James Orange with SCLC. He was the one that was training us. He was the one that uh, had Barbara Howard. I don't know if you knew Barbara Howard was like this. You know, she and I worked together a lot with that. But she was the, our um, head person to go and say, okay, time is right. We already knew that when she came to the door, we were to get up, we were to walk out of school. And that was all the high schools, because the more the merrier. We were all supposed to meet at Alabama State. You had your college students there, and you had all of your high school students coming from Booker, Washington, and Carver, and everything walking. But we had maroon blazers and gray skirts, because that was our, and gray pants, that was our uniform. So we would remember a newscaster. It might very well it might have been Frank McGee. I can't say, because I know it was a newscaster. He, I know he wasn't in Montgomery at the time, but he might have still been reporting. And he mentioned a sea of maroon because we were all together in that group. That most famous photo, everybody, I think, literally in the world, it has gone global, is the one that you see Martin Luther King, an albino minister, he's not white, an albino minister, Reverend Jesse Douglas. You see Reverend Abernathy, you see uh, Reverend James Foreman. Uh, and some others, and actually you only see five on the picture, but there's a lot more on that picture. And they're walking down the street, actually coming from uh, Alabama State, and people think that that's the Selma to Montgomery March, and we have to make a clarification of that. No, this was the week prior to. This was to make sure that we are going to have a safe march when we come from Selma the next go-round. So when people ask, well, were you how do you know about this march? Because the picture is taken right in front of our home. And I said, oh, I was in that march because it was a lot of people in that march. So we remember that. We remember a lot of the other protests. But that night um, when the marches came in, March 24th, and we had the uh, Stars for Freedom over at St. Jude, and we had, uh, oh gosh, Harry Belafonte and Sidney Poitier, Joan Baez, and Sammy Davis Jr., and a whole list of artists that were on a makeshift stage, you know, uh, the people were there to be entertained and just re-energized again. They were exhausted. I think I mentioned earlier about my mom and her group would make sandwiches for them and the, the, um, the black physicians would take care of the feet because there were no Reeboks, there were no bottled water, there were no, none of the, the things that we have today. So they needed to have some things addressed. But uh, yeah, that was um, another check mark for <laughs> civil rights activity and participation. And then, of course, we got up the next day and marched from St. Jude to the march downtown. And uh, that's when I would tell people, I said, I was right there under that tree. I knew exactly where I was standing with my friends. Did you, did you go to the, the concert, The Night of the Stars? Oh, yes. Okay. Oh, yes. Tell me a little oh, bit yeah. about oh, that. Oh, yeah. That's what I was saying, that that night, um, <laughs> This, this is, I don't even know if I want to tell this story, but uh, you're going to twist me. That particular night, uh, we were there. And as I said, this, it was on our campus, so of course we were there. And you know, um, you're walking through a crowd of people that have just walked miles. <laughs> I'm going to leave your imagination miles, and I am this height, and I'm walking at uh, armpit level of everybody, okay? And also to mention the bruised feet that you see. Uh, that was the thing that got to me, was that uh, these people deserve everything that they're getting, all the entertainment they can possibly get. But because of that, I was trying to make my way to the front so that I could see the group, and I was saying things like, um, excuse me, excuse me, I'm trying to get to my brother. He wasn't there, but trying to get to my brother, I want to get to the front. Excuse me, excuse me. But by the time I had gotten through all of that, all that I know that I must have passed out, 
because of somebody must have airlifted me because I was on a brick wall near the near the 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 entertainment. So I could still hear and see the artist, but not as close up as I wanted to. But my girlfriends were saying things like they bumped into um, uh, James Baldwin, or that they remember seeing, and I do remember seeing all these people, now don't get me wrong, but I didn't get to see all of them, see it like I really wanted to see it, but they were there, they were there. But we did get up and go right back over there the next day to join the crowd to walk down Oak Street, you know, the trail, and to come up uh, Dexter. Uh, with the group. Tell, you now you make this transition like your father had. You go to Fisk University and you have a really a continuation of your experiences at Fisk. Tell, tell us about that. Yeah, uh, Fisk was, um, you know, at this point, I, I often think think back when, when one when why daddy said okay for these kids to come in the Freedom Riders, but so many of them were from Fisk and you're wondering did that have anything to do with it? But I'm sure that every lot of things play, came into place, but I'm sure that didn't hurt. But so we knew that too. So when we got to Fisk, my sister, now she was already there. Um, and I had a cousin ahead of me that was there. That was uh, uh, the, the uncle that owned the restaurant. His daughter was there. She's two years ahead. I mean, she was there. Uh, a lot of friends from Montgomery, Georgette Norman was there. All of, the, all of us went to Fisk University in Nashville. But um, while I'm there, I'm brought up in Montgomery as a child, grow up with the nonviolent mindset and the, um, you know, direct action and all from Martin Luther King. That's in me. But as I get there, now SNCC has changed. And SNCC has changed leadership and Student Nonviolent Coordinator Committee, for those that don't know what SNCC is, which really was uh, John Lewis was a leader. And then because things started to change, Stokely Carmichael became the leader, and he was on all of our campuses recruiting. And um, your mindset changes because you're becoming a little bit more radicalized, not militarized. I won't use that phrase because it wasn't anything like that. But you are becoming a little bit more radicalized. Your, um, your attire changes. You know, everything was I'm black and I'm proud. The uh, froze started to come out. The dashiki started to come out. Uh, you're still organizing. I'm toying with both of these kinds of things. But the protest, it was, you know, if there's to be a protest, nobody even questioned a protest. And I had friends that had been in, one, in Birmingham, like one, my very closest friend, uh, Carolyn Ma McKinstry, that was in the church, 16th Street Church, when it was bombed. In fact, she was the one that got the call. She was there with all of us. So we all knew how to protest and knew when it was coming. Uh, we weren't militant. You know, we still had fun college lives, but if there was a protest to be had, that's what we were going to do. But it was um, that April, April 4th of 1968, that was it for me. When people say, when, when did you reach your breaking point? That was it for me. I was in a dormant, that was the day that Martin Luther King was assassinated. And this person was like my uncle. I'd seen him all the time hugged them all the time, you know, even when they left the city six years later in 1960, there was still communication, you know, graduation gifts, Christmas gifts, and all these kinds of things. But that particular night, um, when we heard about him being assassinated in Memphis, we were in Nashville, the dorm that I was living in was on a corner of, uh, in, in Nashville. It was, uh, had previously been a male dorm, but we were there. and. A group of us were just so, so angry. We went up on the roof and we were making Molotov cocktails and we wanted to just throw it down to anybody that we saw white coming past. And it was the first time and only time in my life that I felt pure hate. And it was a not a good feeling. And luckily we didn't follow through on it, but the hate was there. It was like, I can't take this anymore. I just cannot take any more of this. Because you have to understand, I've been doing this since I'm eight eight years old and then just, it was just way too much. It was just too much. And, um, but that's when I talk to people and tell that story, I say I understand the mentality of people that riot. I understand the mentality of those riots, um, in particular Rodney King, when they went and dragged um, Reginald Denny out of the truck 
And they weren't after Reginald Denny. They were after what Reginald Denny represented. You just had enough. You just can't take any more of this. And um, unfortunately, that's what I'm seeing a lot of repeating today. And that's, it bothers me. It's one, one I haven't started to break down in tears because I've been crying almost every day since George Floyd because it's a repeat. It's a repeat, definitely a repeat of our life. But yeah, that was, uh, that was that. And so, yeah, by that time we kind of mellowed out. Um, when I graduated from there and I went to Maryland and in 1972, George Wallace is there, uh, uh, two exits away from where I lived when he was shot. And I just remember it just in my mind going, mm -hmm, it's your turn now. That's an ugly thought, that's an ugly thought. But if I'm to be honest, after everything that I've already been through, you know, it's, uh, it's understandable, you know, at that time, because you have blocked us from so many opportunities. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about um, your, your what, what then takes you into exercise physiology? How did that transition? Wow, uh, that's, let's go backwards. Mm -hmm. um, as a child, I loved to play. I was the tomboy. I mean, you know, the tree climber, the bike rider, just all over the place. So play and movement, it was something about movement that would drive me. And for whatever reason, I have no idea why, but my mom gave me, when I was about eight or nine years old, maybe 10 at best, she gave me three uh, kind of paperback books, and one said, plyometrics, isometrics, isokinetic. And I was just, that was just it for me. I loved all, it was all about exercise, all about exercise. And I took dance as well from Miss Gloria Smiley uh, and uh, Miss Olene Underwood. But Gloria Smiley, who I referred to as Aunt Gloria, I wanted to be her. I want, she was my role model. And she was a physical educator. And that's what movement was all about. And it wasn't about sports, it was about movement. and all of the above. So anyway, um, and I like the anatomy and the physiology part of it. I thought that I was going to be a pharmacist because you know, somebody, because I was a science math person, that was my strength, that I could take over for my dad. I just loved my dad, anything he wanted to do. But there were two brothers that he was, groom, was grooming, neither one of them really was interested, but he was grooming the two of them to do it. And I had never seen a female pharmacist, and definitely not seen a black female pharmacist, so I didn't really push that idea. But uh, the only avenue for college majors for anatomy and physiology and movement was physical education. And uh, so that's what I majored in at, uh, at Fisk. And then when I got out, of course, when you come out, they put you into teaching. You either can be a teacher or a nurse during that time, or secretary, that's all that black, oh, that women, I was a black women, that's all that women could do during that time. So I wound up teaching, which is what I really did not want to do. But because I was assigned at one school to teach um, students that had impairments, that's another reason it came in, because then I can correct your movements and make sure you're rolling a ball, you can bounce the ball. So I'm looking at all of the social, the skills, physical skills that you're supposed to do. So long story short, I got into to that field and still in the classroom teaching. I come back to Alabama. Alabama, you know, you even though you're a national teacher exam and all of the above, you still got to take all of these courses to teach in Alabama. And I said, well, okay, if I have to do that, I'm going to take some more science classes. And uh, that's going to lead me to pharmacy school <laughs> at Auburn, you know. But uh, I had all of these science classes, which meant that now, instead of me teaching physical education, you put me in the science classroom. And I thought I would just about pass out, because I don't know, I don't know anything about this, but yet that's where I was. And I loved every minute of it, teaching the life science, and the earth science in particular, and the physical sciences. So while, I, and one, in physical education, I still had to have three classes in order to get the master's pay, because by this time, I had had a master's degree in physical education. And I was at Capitol Heights Junior High when we had a student teacher from Auburn. She's actually a, a teacher at, back at Huntington now, but she was big time at Auburn. She turned out to be big time at Auburn. She was a student teacher, and her name was Michelle Sharp. Her name is now Dr. Olson, Michelle Sharp Olson. 
And she came in and she put her book down, textbook, exercise physiology, put a textbook on my desk uh, just to rest. And I was thumbing through it and I said, this is what I'm talking about. This is what I want to do. This is everything that I wanted to do. And so about two years or so later, there came a, um, a promotion, um, like, you know, the postcard that promotes different programs around the state of Alabama that had a sports medicine program, United States Sports Academy down in Daphne, International Sports Academy. I said, that's what I want. I got to go. I got to go. I got to go here. I had children. Now, you talk about divine movement. I can't even explain the drive for that. But I packed up my children. I went down to Mobile, to Daphne. I uh, got a master's degree in sports medicine. Uh, in order to do my, um, uh, to finish it, I had a choice of an internship. Uh, and the internship could either be with the athletic department or go into the clinic. And I chose the clinic and worked on the physical therapist, uh, which happened to be my husband, soon to be husband. And uh, I loved it. I loved the rehab. I loved the clinic. I was still able to take all that exercise knowledge but direct it towards rehab and, and teaching people how to move again. Some people that have had strokes, I'm ready to do all of this. So I did that for 12 years as an exercise physiologist, designing uh, particular exercise prescriptions for orthopedically impaired people, uh, primarily because if they're coming to a rehab, you, we might be treating you, let's say, for um, knee problem, but you also have diabetes and you have heart problems, and I've got to take all of that into it when I designed this program for you. And I loved it. I mean, I absolutely loved it. Well, it turned out that, and I did that for 12 years with Dr. Warner Pinchback here in Montgomery. It turned out that insurance companies stopped paying for my services, and so they had to let me go. And that's when I said, okay, I want a PhD. I'm going to Auburn. And I wanted to go to have a degree from Auburn all my life because they told me I couldn't have one. The doors were shut. And I said, I'm going up to Auburn and get this doctorate. And I got accepted and fell in love with it. Then because of Michelle, again, going back to Michelle Olson, she was pushing and pushing. She's much younger than I am, but she kept pushing. And I wanted what she had. I wanted everything that she had. And she just kept pushing and steered me. And, uh, and, uh, and that's how I wound up getting into, into that field, because the curriculum takes you through um, motor skills and learning and how a baby crawls and anything and you know what to do how to lift to reach something out of the kinesiology part which I really thoroughly enjoyed um, and of course then I ultimately wound up uh, at Alabama State once the clinical doctorate program of physical therapy uh, began and I became a, a faculty member there and that was it. It just it just took off. I was at home. Now I'm combining everything that I've done in a clinic, and everything I know from academia, and combining it together. And uh, here I am. <laughs> That's it. I love it. Talk talk to me a little bit about you, you combine your life experiences in another way, and that is in terms of sharing with people. Um, your experiences in the civil rights movement and in, in, in America, as a, as, a, as a participant in the American experience and American history, talk to me about that and, and, and something that you're doing right now, and that's storytelling. You know, how, how, does, how has this played out in your life? Uh, it's, it's, it's strange how it began. As I said, I always knew the story. Um, it, even further back in, uh, I'm going to say, uh, like the 19, just prior to going to Auburn, let's say that, or right at, during that time frame. So this is before I, I came to Alabama State. The story had been in my head. I said, all of these things, all these memories in my head, I said, I've got to get them down. I just, I, I just want them on paper. So I just started recording myself. Everything is just out there. And I start piecing everything together and put it down uh, like in a really scrambled manuscript. And I just pretty much left it that way. And uh, I was at a group, it's two ways that I got into this. I, I, I was at a meeting with just some people, nothing, just a real informal, casual social meeting. And I was telling the story. And one of the ladies that was at the table, uh, well, actually was at Doris Crenshaw's house. And some people, a lot of people know Doris Crenshaw. And this was uh, Gladys Gillis that was there too. 
And I was talking to Mrs. Gillis, to Gladys, and she said, um, oh, well, she said, have you ever just written this down? I said, I, I, I wrote it down. She says, where, where is it? I said, in the trunk of my car. And I said it just like that. This is a brown envelope in the trunk of my car. She said, just bring it to me. I'll, I'll be glad to read what you've done. I'll be glad to do it. And she took it and she said, don't change a thing. She put it in chapter form. And she said, leave it just like it is, just very pure, because it was just the, the writings, was the story, it was like storytelling. And she asked me, why did you want to do this? I said, really, two reasons. I said, because I'm looking at children. And when I say children, I mean those that are really right under me, even 50-year-olds at that time, uh, seemed to think that our civil rights movement all happened at one time. And I said, but that was over 10 years of my life, from the time I'm eight, I'm growing up in this, and you um, don't need to separate it. They are different separate entities, like a big umbrella, but different sprockets of that umbrella. And the second reason was when uh, my sister and I were talking about uh, uh, knowing Dr. King, we were invited to talk to a group of fourth graders here in Montgomery, and the teacher had already prepped them that uh, we lived down the street from Dr. King and his family. And so after we did our talk, the little girl raised her hand and she said, did you, did you really know Dr. King? And I said, yeah. She said, did you know Harriet Tubman? And I said, no, <laughs> I did not know Harriet Tubman. But it also made me realize again the importance of putting this in some type of perspective, hopefully that they could, you know, they could understand. But uh, that was the way the, the story was written and it, it I called the book, I made the book, and it's, it's now, you know, you can get it. But I called it Just a Neighbor because people always ask, well, what was it like to live down the street from Dr. King? And we would just, my mom and all of us would pretty much just shrug our shoulders and say, well, you know, to us, he was just a neighbor. So to tell those kinds of stories and how it impacted me during my developmental time. But I have to give credit to Dr. Janice Franklin because while I'm on faculty, at Alabama State, she uh, has the patrons of uh, the National Center. And she called and she said, I need you on the board. I need you to come and just think about it. just sitting on the board. And I was like, I got so much to do. And she, I didn't even know what everything was about at the time. And she said, I just really need you to come and sit on the board. And she said, you only can meet, you only meet four times a year. That's all you have to give. And then uh, Zenobia Crawford, Dr. Crawford was, I think, was the president at that time. She was also my chair, and she said, go on and just go out there. So I agreed to go because she's the chair, and Dr. Franklin I already know, and so I went over there. And then the next thing I know is I wound up being the president <laughs> for three, what are, three terms, for three terms, eight years. And I loved it because I learned so much. In other words, what I learned was what I lived, but didn't realize the importance of what I lived. So by being there, you too, you and, and, and uh, Frazine Taylor and uh, Dr. Franklin and, every, and Dr. Autry kept filling my head with the importance of my story and then the importance of the house itself and then the connection with Dorothy Walker that was there at the time too. And then next thing Dorothy's at the Freedom Rides Museum, the Freedom Rides Museum opens up. And then I'm seeing the connection with that. So it has, um, I can't explain it because I didn't seek any of this out. But when I found out the, um, the importance of the house so much, um, again in 2006, Dr. Franklin, uh, uh, Ms. Crenshaw, Doris Crenshaw, and some others were responsible for helping to get that marker, Beverly Ross at that time too, to get the marker put on the front of the house for the Harris House. And uh, they planned this big event and invited John Lewis and everybody who did the unveiling of the marker. So again, we think, well, it's our turn. We finally, we know the story. Finally, everybody knows the story. But still didn't think anybody was interested in visiting like they did until Ms. Shirley Cherry started bringing groups from the parsonage. They would visit the parsonage. She would tell them about my mom who sat on the porch all the time. They would come down, they'd sit and they'd talk with my mom, hold her hand. She would tell them all the stories. And then eventually they start uh, 
inching their way, so to speak. Do you think we can get in the house to come and see? We can go in the house, and they did. And to see the looks on their faces and the, the, the words that would come out of their mouth, the emotions, some would just cry. You know, that's when we start seeing the, uh, the importance of the, the house. And uh, when um, Brian Stevenson opened the Legacy Museum, that was really one of the times when we got a big influx of people to come in, uh, including Gloria Steinem and a lot of other people that were here for that. And she came in and she was like, you just, you need to have a story. And this needs to be a play. It needs to be a movie. And so these are the kinds of things that I was being told and understanding now the, um, the importance of the home. And ultimately, um, the World Monument funds the people that uh, supply funding for preservation of sites around the world decided to group together 20 sites in Alabama, 20 civil rights sites in Alabama to preserve. And of those 20 sites, nine are in Montgomery. And of the nine, three of us are in a row, the Parsonage, our home, and the Benmore Hotel. So again, it's taken on another level of importance. And um, so yeah, when, uh, when my mom passed, I just said, I, I cannot let this house out of the family. I just can't, so it's still in the family but we now have uh, uh, tours by appointment only so that we can share the story and give the, its, its educational purpose. That's what we want to do. So I get to tell my story. <laughs> okay.